Okay. Great. Can you all see? Yeah. Good. And I'll load up the chat as well. So if anyone wants to um message me while we're talking, I'll kind of periodically look at the look at the chat. Thank you so many so much for coming to us. Uh, <laughs> to this workshop it's nice to see um people from the previous workshop joining as well so this one's a little bit different a little bit more hands-on a little bit more um practical i guess less computers and it kind of comes from a an ongoing practice i guess of using very very simple diy technologies to reveal different different sounds and different spectrum and i'll i'll be talking about the the basics of putting those together and also showing you some stuff around how I kind of incorporate and use and use those sounds. Um, so I've called it expanded sense. And the structure of what we will do today, if I can find my mouse, is we will realize that pretty much anything can be used as a transducer. We can use anything to convert energy from one realm into another. And this is really exciting. Um, and we can even use sort of technology that is used for, you know, specific things. We can just reverse it. And um, a really good example of this is taking a pair of headphones and just reversing that circuit by putting a jack plug on those, plugging it into an amplifier and turning it into a lo-fi microphone. So we're really going to play around with experimenting with what objects we have in our houses obviously the, the components that we've brought and what we can do with these objects to to make interesting sounds and reveal different areas of vibration okay and so a little bit of a split of what will happen is i'll do an intro i'll talk a bit about who i am where i'm coming from don't worry if you came last week or well, last time, this is going to be be different. It's going to focus specifically on this kind of strand of practice. Then moving into some concept, con like context where I'll talk about people who are working in this area, pioneers, people who I find really inspirational and some cool, cool resources. And then we're going to get into making stuff for the last part of the, of the, uh, of the workshop, probably like the last hour. So who am I? I'm Dan, and um, you probably all know from meeting me, I think I've met all of you. And way, way back when I was sort of get, getting started in making making art, I used to work in studios a lot. And I kind of pivoted from being in studios to doing this, this course at Bath Spa University that was about sound art, and I knew absolutely nothing about sound art. And one of the resources that really was important to me at the time was this amazing book called Handmade Electronic Music by Nicholas Collins. And if you haven't come across this book, if you haven't um, looked at it before, I would definitely recommend checking it out. In fact, it's even linked in my presentation. Also, I think someone has their microphone on. If you would be able to turn it off, that would be amazing. Awesome. So this is a really, really, really great book. She does, yeah, she knows to do it. Yeah. She's really gonna learn about everything. <laughs> okay. I muted you, Lynn, sorry. Anyway, um, so there was this little passage in this book about this uh, this thing called VLF. And this is pretty much everything this book had about VLF, one, one paragraph. And for me, it just really stood out, this idea that these gigantic coils of wire could convert radio from outer space into sounds that we could hear in a really, really simple interface. Particularly what stood out for me, actually, was this line about meteorites self-immolating as they enter the Earth's atmosphere, which really excited me. Unfortunately, uh, we can't really hear meteorites as they as they uh, enter the Earth's atmosphere in, unless they would be incredibly large. Uh, and really excite the electromagnetic spectrum. It's not really a thing, but it sounds cool. But this really got me on this kick of, of exploring these uh, DIY radio devices to basically listen to radio that's naturally produced by the Earth and the ionosphere. 
And even further afield, you can pick up things like sunspots. Um, you can pick up Jovian radio, which is sort of the, the emissions from Jupiter. So there's lots of interesting sounds that, that come from this. And largely, a lot of these sounds sound like static and noise. So some of the work I've done in later years is really trying to find a, a way of making these sounds, which to many people who aren't interested in this stuff at a kind of a, a granular level, a bit more palatable. So working with visuals and working with uh, interactivity to sort of um, bring them into this world and, and then kind of engage a bit with the, the science of radio spectrums. But the uh, the kind of the core for me at the beginning was building these sort of large antennas and putting them on weather balloons as an interface that allowed people to sort of come and explore, thinking it was more of a sculptural object, and then kind of find out about the sounds and the science through that. And that kind of was my practice for a good five or six years, where I was really very, very, very involved in um, the world of of very low frequency. And these are some of the, you know, the outputs of installations or or events I would do. I would go walking to quite remote places because one of the things that's very prevalent in this band is it also picks up man-made signals. So particularly things like the electric grid. And if you haven't heard the electric grid in EM, it just sounds like a 50 or 60 hertz hum, depending where you are in the world. And it's incredibly loud and creates harmonics all through the frequency spectrum. So it's also extremely hard to then post process and filter that out because it's just got all these harmonics stacked on top of each other. Um, so I would go and I, I, I kind of take this, um, this work to mountains and places that are far away from cities to try and capture the, these kind of un, un, un like these, these kind of pure natural signals was the goal. And then obviously, because I live in cities, I work in cities, I, I started being more drawn to the actual electromagnetic sounds that the cities produce. So doing things like um, rather stupidly, actually walking under electrical towers with VLF antennas on balloons. It looks cool, but if it had floated up a few feet, I could have been fried. So less of that now. But this is... Um, kind of my interface for how I got involved in in working with different um, sound spectra. And it also fed into an educational practice. So about 2013, I think it was, I first published a little pamphlet called VLF, The Sound Artist's Guide. And randomly it kind of got picked up by, by a number of places and sort of circulated. And there was enough interest that a few years later I was able to do an expanded edition, kind of properly produce it, get some people to uh, write about their own practice as well and have um, a bit of a dialogue with artists in this field. But I think particularly the draw of this publication was that it had a very simple recipe to create a VLF antenna. And that made it kind of this, this kind of like very accessible tool that people could sort of come to and have no knowledge about very low frequency and and get into it and then that kind of progressed into into working with some magazines particularly randomly architecture magazines like the site in canada and that's when i kind of restaged some of these earlier installations to to um, match with that work again everything in the presentation is linked so if you want to go and check out this guide from way back you can go and go and take a look it's it's pretty short but it has some some useful content if you want to get started listening to these these spectrum we won't be list, we won't be building any vlf antennas today because they just require so much raw material but the one of the circuits that we'll build is basically like a teeny tiny vlf antenna it, it's a device to pick up magnetic fields um you just have to build it a lot bigger and get a certain radius of um of pickup wire to to actually hear this spectrum but basically it's exactly the same process of coiling wire for me, something that's been a real pleasure to see is the fact that it has been picked up by various folks. Um, and people often email me pictures of, of people kind of playing around with the, the, the antennas that they make, um, particularly when people outside of academia get into this stuff. I was sent this recently by um, two folks at Concordia 
um, Angus Tarnowski and Owen Chapman, who are doing a lot of stuff with, with listening and sound. And they had a project where they were doing listening um, in various ways with high school students. So this is a group of, you know, 14 to 17 year olds who had an afternoon to build these antennas and then are going out and listening to this spectrum that they probably didn't know existed before that day. And I really like this kind of way of basically exploring through making and exploring through sound rather than through exploring through the technical elements and the science, having a kind of improvisational approach to making these tools. Because for me, I think the way I've come at a lot of this stuff is, is through making and not necessarily having a great handle on the science, but through being enthusiastic and being interested in these sounds, that's kind of been the, the pull, I guess, that's made me then research scientifically and, 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 and spend the time to, to learn deeper about these kinds of um, the back end of what's happening here. So for me, that's a nice pipeline is kind of just doing something very simply and being very playful about it. And then using that as the hook to get you interested in the actual mechanics. So I'll play a little clip of um, what some of these sounds actually sound like. I had the opportunity to actually make a radio documentary in about 2015, 2016, where I collated some of my work and uh, a number of folks who I was really inspired by into a sort of a stream of consciousness um, quadraphonic installation and kind of playing into that idea that mostly this sounds like noise. I'll play a short clip. It starts off with um, a sort of a pioneer in the area called Stephen McCreevy, who builds these little whip antennas that look like this. I don't know if you can see me super well, so I'll just hold it up to the camera. Um, they're very good B field antennas. The antennas that I build are a lot simpler. They're, they're loops. Um, and the reason I like to build loops is basically you can just plug that into any amplifier, any audio recorder. Um, Steven does a little bit of electronics. It's just packaged in a nice box and you get this little whip antenna. Um, and it's specifically tuned for listening to things like Aurora and Northern Lights. So you can just put it in your backpack, take it out into the country and kind of like tune in to, to these sounds. So it's, it's a really handy device to have. Um, but he has sort of based his life around a passion for listening to these sounds from the ionosphere in space. He lives in a deserted lake bed and gets up every morning at like four or five to to just go out and, and record these signals. So he has some of the best recordings and it starts off with, with his uh, audio log. And let me know if you can hear. Okay, now by about uh, eight minutes before 6 a.m., 12, uh, coming up on uh, 1,300 hours uh, in about uh, six or seven minutes, it's 0600. On 12 April 2011, near Kilo, California, this is Whistler's beautiful this morning, early on a Tuesday morning, uh, it's just beginning to be daybreak. So what we're hearing there is lightning strikes from pretty much all across the globe. And um, what's amazing about the VLF band is when a big impulse of energy hits the earth, then bounces between the ionosphere and creates these little pitched clicks, which um, to me, I find really meditative and really, really relaxing. Um, but the thing that everyone really wants to hear in this band is this thing called a whistler, which is where there's kind of like a hazy layer of cloud coverage, which means that the timing of that pulse kind of gets delayed. So you get the, the high frequency swooshing down before the, the low frequency of that kind of impulse. And so that's uh, what a lot of people want to hear because it just sounds really interesting. These weren't quite there, but you're getting kind of that, that pulsed impulse rather than clicks. Uh, and what also is super interesting to me, um, which I kind of incorporated, is around how radio is used in astronomy. And I think this section talks a little bit about that. I'll just play a short little clip and then move on. When you tune in, you probably... 
And in fact, the very medium which gave us the telecommunications revolution that we're all part of today, the telephone. It's 1876, it's in Boston, and this is Alexander Graham Bell, who was working with Thomas Watson on the invention of the telephone. A key part of their technical setup was a half mile long length of wire, which was thrown across the rooftops of several houses in Boston. The line carried the telephone signals that would later make Bell a household name. But like any long length of charged wire, it also inadvertently became an antenna. Thomas Watson spent hours listening to the strange crackles and hisses and chirps and whistles that his accidental antenna detected. Now, you have to remember, this is 10 years before Heinrich Hertz proved the existence of radio waves, 15 years before Nikola Tesla's Fortune circuit, nearly 20 years before Marconi's first broadcast. So Thomas Watson wasn't listening to us. We didn't have the technology to transmit. So what were these strange noises? Watson was in fact listening to very low frequency radio emissions caused by nature. Some of the crackles and pops were lightning, but the eerie whistles and curiously melodious chirps had a rather more exotic origin. Using the very first telephone, Watson was in fact dialed into the heavens. As he correctly guessed, some of these sounds were caused by activity on the surface of the sun. It was the solar wind interacting with our ionosphere that he was listening to. So I find that story to be very, um, very exciting, especially it's such a poetic notion that people are listening to these, these sounds from the ionosphere and from further afield, even before we were able to transmit our own signals. And this idea that um, that radio is purely man-made is, is, is in fact not true because it, obviously so much that we are engaging with is through tapping into these into these electromagnetic and radio spectrums. Um, and I just found that so poetic that this this kind of by accident found this whole spectrum of sound that went kind of unnoticed for a really long time and um, until Bell Labs was having a bunch of interference which they then pinpointed to activity from from the solar wind and and then started building in methods of of um, shielding devices and cables from this um, and then later used that knowledge to build early radio telescopes so i found that super interesting as a sort of a, a as an anecdote about the the start of of this um this kind of field of information for me this kind of developed into an interest in all kinds of, of senses and incorporating the sort of natural elements that I was kind of accessing from the everyday world into my work, which became over time highly digital, as um, you will have seen in some of the, the works I have online and in the installation at NASA. So as part of my master's thesis, I tried to kind of contextualize this somewhat and and find ways of of moving real world signals into digital practice and i'm going to play you a short clip of a of a sketchbook basically of just things that i was playing around with during this process um the whole goal of my masters was to encode information into crystals and also use crystals as a method of um altering information that was projected and transmitted through them so it's kind of an experimental way of holding data in physical objects and also using those objects as an interface for manipulation. Um, it kind of worked, but um, for me, a lot of the experimentation was quite simple, but also quite interesting. Um, there was uh, an installation I tried to build early on, which is sort of an optical version of this installation called Rainforest, which involves um, audio transducers vibrating um, a series of objects. So I tried to kind of create the, essentially the visual version of, of what I imagined this would be. So rather than having hanging objects that um, produce sound, I had hanging objects that reflected light. And then as this light reflected around a space, it would um, alter 
it would hit certain sensors that would then create sounds or create impulses that would control audio software. Um, the reason I'm going to play this is there is a couple of little bits where we're seeing sensors that will build later in uh, in the day, um, just so you get an idea of some of the the work that you can do in this in this area. And primarily, I'll, I'll probably stop it after this plays, but primarily I want to show you this little bit where I have a record playing and I'm using a, a little solar panel, which we'll play with later, and reflecting the light of that record onto the solar panel and actually able to play back um, the audio from that record, which I found to be an interesting thing. So I won't play the whole video. The, the really important bit for me is that very, that very short clip where I'm using a laser on a record to to reflect essentially that groove as the as the laser beam is is um, affected by by that groove um, altering its refraction. It's it's shedding different amounts of light onto that solar panel and creating uh, a difference in in amplitude, which then is is played back as a as a signal. So I found again that to be a really interesting lo-fi um, kind of way of interfacing with sound and interfacing with technology and kind of converting um, from light back into sound. And so one of the things we'll look at a little later is um, a, a sketch for a, for a laser microphone, which I think is a, a super sort of fun thing to do. Um, and also on a more sort of basic level, something that really stuck with me. There's a, a sound artist who comes really from a recording background. He used to do all the field recordings for David Attenborough. And he's a really well-known field recordist called Chris Watson. Uh, and he gave a, a talk at the university I was at in my undergrad. And he talked a lot about um, how he liked to think about working with microphones as an extension of his ears and putting putting his ears in places that he couldn't physically place them. So obviously as he worked in nature recording he put his ears in strange places for example miking up carcasses of dead antelope and hearing vultures ripping off the the flesh um placing microphones down termite hills and so he he obviously had a really a lot of access to putting microphones in interesting places but that really stuck with me that this is kind of like a like an extension of your auditory sense and so just in terms of the materials I collect a lot I like to use things like contact microphones and hydrophones and unfortunately this this year has been not so great for ice on the lake in um, Ontario at least in Toronto and I had um, a weekend I guess where I just kind of went down just threw some threw some mics on the lake and just sat back for a couple of hours just listening to the lake expanding and contracting And um, for me, it's also, again, it's one of these things where where NASA is. I know Darren has two hydrophones frozen into the lake that are recording at all times. Um, for where I'm recording, we're right by Billy Bishop Airport. So you're also getting all that, um, all those vibrations from airplanes taking off. And so in certain sections, the, the ice is actually really vibrating from the from these airplanes kind of taking taking off and you can really you can really feel it in the, in the recordings um so it's kind of like you you get 
to almost sense the world through a completely different medium. Another way I sort of have ended up repurposing some of these some of these transducers is um, let's see I'm just going to grab my so this is this is what the hydrophone I built looks like it's actually built from a, a design by a chap who was trying to record mollusks um, being eaten by um, sea parasites. And so it's really simple, but mainly what it is designed to do is just take a, a piezo disc, like the like the kind we'll be using later today, like these these little things, um, which pick up vibrations, and just really sealing it. So there's a bit of there's a, a rubber um, washer in there, and then just sealing it within some plastic, so that you can just put it into the water, and it's not gonna it's not gonna get wet. The other important thing about it is is having a large membrane. So when you're building things, especially with piezo discs, which have a very often um, small surface area, can be quite tinny, building something that expands that membrane so that they can pick up a greater, uh, they can pick up greater wavelengths essentially, um, does help. There's also some little circuits, which I'll share with you later, um, that can, cut the impedance. One of the problems with piezo discs is they have mismatched impedance with pretty much all amplifiers. So when you plug them in, you automatically get a high pass filter that cuts off the low end, which is why they classically sound really tinny. You can relatively simply with a couple of components build uh, little preamps for them, or you can buy very cheap preamps that, that also work. But this is like kind of a misconception around uh, piezos that they, that they are tinny. They don't have to be. For me, the the way I like to record, I'm really just focused on accessing the the sort of the the vibe of something. I'm not necessarily like an audio purist. And I know that's bad to say when I'm giving a, a talk on sound art, but for me, I want to capture the material and I want to capture that material with whatever tools I have to hand. And if it's like a perfect pristine recording, that's great. And if it's like slightly tinny, I have enough post-production skills that I can then post-process that and bring up the bass and, and, and work that in. So for me, I'm mostly concerned about capturing uh, different strands of, of information from these, from these devices, uh, whilst obviously also thinking it's important to know about how to make it better. So at least I have the the option of of getting an improved signal if I if I wanted to make say a whole album of hydrophone records of of hydrophone recordings, um, but I wanted to show you this because this is the same device I was using for for that recording that I just played you, uh, really repurposed. I spent some time in in Iceland over the summer doing a residency, and wasn't really sure what I was going to do. I kind of went in with like not really a plan and I just really wanted to do something really basic. So I brought just a, a bag of really small components, a couple of crocodile clips and mainly just a lot of little speaker cones like the ones you can see here. And kind of just by accident, I found that by placing a speaker cone on the top and on the bottom and placing a lava rock on the, the sort of the resonating body of the of the transducer, I was able to create this really um, surprising feedback loop that was self-sustaining uh, without playing anything through either of the speakers. So the rock was adding to this this circuit, it was adding this vibration to the circuit, which was almost imperceptible. Um, and at first, when I sort of tried it, I was extremely surprised that it created this self-sustaining um, feedback in such a way. Anyway, I I then that became sort of like part of what I was playing around with as part of that residency, creating a, a little piece slash performance called Ontology of Stones.
And basically for that piece, it sounds like there's a lot of audio processing going on there, but there, there's extreme, there's basically none. I, I created a couple of different, very simple little filtering patches in, in Max just to take off some high end or some low end. And basically just by playing around with feedback, I was able to create some really dense um, sound palettes as part of that, um, which was really interesting because essentially, you know, a lot of times we're trying to avoid feedback and obviously there's tons and tons of art and music that incorporates feedback, but, but often when you are working with something like this, which is such a thin membrane and such a tinny little, um, you know, piezo disc, feedback does not sound pleasant because it immediately goes to the higher registers. So the fact that it was actually super bassy was really surprising and, and kind of became like a, a little bit of an obsession for me in that, in that, um, trip. Anyway, that's a little bit about where I'm coming from. And I just want to show you a few things for some inspiration and for some, for some, for some context. And um, I think we all at this point know the transducer is a device that converts energy from one form to another. I found it really interesting. Um, and Lauren was, was here as well. We went to a, a conference in upstate New York about transducer music, particularly this rainforest piece. And it's such a wide area transducer. It could, it's, so, it, it's so vast. It could be all sorts of things, but pretty much everyone talked about transduction vibration. So basically putting, putting something that vibrates on a, on a membrane and, and, and playing sound through that. And that can be a really interesting thing because when you do that, you're essentially trying to find the resonant frequency of whatever that object is. Um, and excite that. So you can kind of sweep through different um, kind of material or sine tones or, or frequencies to actually try and excite that material. But beyond creating essentially a unique speaker, um, there's so many more things you can do with transduction, like you, for example, you know, radio translation. So translating radio into, sa into sa sound vibrations that we can hear is transduction. The audio that we just hear naturally in our ears can be trans is, is technically transduced because we have this vibration in our cochlea that transforms that into electrical impulses. So it's such a wide thing. It doesn't necessarily have to relate to sound. It could relate to converting light into audio or audio into light. It can be this, this very open field. So it was really weird that everything was, was just about this one specific uh, subset. And Today, we're going to play around with a few different ways of using transducers and, and, and building little transducers to, to just try and access material. And some of it's going to be noisy and some of it's not going to work and, and some of it's going to be really interesting. So um, the, the main thing I want us to get through today is just not being scared to try plugging things into amplifiers and seeing what happens and just experimenting as much as we can with that. So a few artists who I, I think are really amazing in this field who are really worth checking out. Um, my number one fave is uh, Joyce Hinterding. And Joyce has such a broad body of work. She's based in Australia and works out of, I think, the Blue Mountains. And so I came across her through this piece over here called Areology. And Areology is essentially a, a gallery piece that evolves based on which, whatever gallery it's installed that. And it is a lot of wire, kilometers of wire wrapped around the structure of the gallery and then plugged into um, audio, amplification, audio amplification. So basically the gallery becomes an antenna, it becomes an interface. So everything that's passing through that gallery or in the area of that gallery is turned into some form of sound. So all the electromagnetic activity from people's phones, from computer screens that are in the building from the electric grid, from transit, from cars, all sorts of things kind of come through. So it's really revealing this wider electromagnetic spectrum whilst also being quite a, a stunning piece. Like I find in itself, just I find the, the wire very attractive as a, as a, um, as a material. Um, a lot of her work does focus around converting electromagnetic energy into sound. But she's also done a lot of stuff, you know, outside of that, building VR games, working with scientists who are doing kind of things astronomically. Uh, but an, a work I think is really interesting is building these sort of um, 
graphite transducers, so graphite antennas, and basically using different um, path finding algorithms to create these, these drawn pieces that also act as antenna and trying to basically fill the space as um, densely as possible without touching. Because obviously if we touch when we're creating an antenna, we create a short circuit and it doesn't work. So, so I'm just going to mute you, Lynn. <laughs> um, so I think her work's really interesting and worth checking out because it's really, um, it's really very deep. Someone else who you may have heard of who's awesome is Christina Kubisch. And Christina Kubisch um, created this whole series called Electrical Walks. And I think in the interest of, of time, I'm not going to play the clip, but if you want to go back, it's, it's, a, it's a nice little documentary about electrical walks. What this work really entailed was building these EM antennas into, into headphones. And at the time, apparently it was quite challenging to kind of get all the mechanics small enough that it could be on these in the in these over ear headphones in like the late 80s, early 90s. And then this became a series of sound walks. So you would go and you get given a pair of headphones and you could then walk around um, this kind of prescripted walk in the city that would take you to different areas. So it would allow you to experience the city through a different spectrum, expanding your sense and you know, it'd take you to things like ATMs and to neon lights and all kinds of things. But so rather than kind of a regular sound walk where you, you know, you probably go to a nice river, you're trying to immerse yourself in the most um, aggressive sounds potentially in, in this spectrum, the most active to, to sort of understand that hidden world that we do interact with every day. But super interesting work, would definitely recommend uh, checking out that work. I guess it's playing, so I'll just let you have like 30 seconds before we move on to the next slide. Which were okay. Again, going back, Handmade Electronic Music, amazing book, linked above. The reason I would recommend looking at this book is because it, if anything we do today is of interest, this book is kind of the next step. We're just kind of plugging in a bunch of sensors into amplifiers. What handmade electronic music will allow you to do is to take that one notch up, still quite simple, but adding in additional layers of, of control. So essentially a lot of the techniques he works with are with CMOS chips, which at the time, and we're kind of moving away from CMOS chips in those kind of tacky kids' toys that make sound. Essentially, they were the, the brain of a lot of a lot of children's toys, you know, the, the things that you press and it would make a little sound. And so basically these are digital clocks that are very, very cheap, only like a dollar or less very often. And so essentially plugging in different sensors and transducers into um, ports on these clocks allows you to create different, um, basically very, very simple synthesizers. And so all the all the components that we use can be plugged into these types of circuits and act essentially as modulators or control. Um, what Nick Collins did, one of the things that he's sort of known for is building a little bit like Namjoon Pak did with, um, he, Namjoon Pak made these tape gloves. It's not one of his better known works, but essentially you put on the glove and it had a lot of tape heads on it. And you could then run your hands over analog tape on the wall. And then you essentially like acting like a, you're scrubbing through like a, like a DJ and you can kind of move around and it's, you, you feel like a, a cool cat. Nicholas Collins kind of did that, but with <laughs> electromagnets on his fingers. You get the you get the idea. Next slide. And now this is really uh, a little bit 
left field, I guess, but I think a really interesting take on the idea of translation and transduction. There's a, a sort of a sound scholar called Joe Banks, and he, he does have a practice working with electromagnetic audio too. Um, but he wrote a whole book about um, EVP, electronic voice phenomena, and essentially uh, human perception and how human perception can be very confused by these noisy type sounds and hear, hear ghosts in, in the signal. And so it's a really interesting book that takes you through this kind of how our brain interprets a lot of these sound worlds and this technology um, in this kind of liminal space where we're trying to make something out of the noise. There's often times when when working with these types of signals where you accidentally, you know, we're not working with perfect circuitry. So you accidentally tap into different radio bands and you hear weird things. Like I remember one time in the UK, I was on top of Salisbury Hill trying to do some VLF recording. And somehow I tapped into this evangelical radio station from presumably the States. And it was modulating with the with the recording. So it would kind of go from really high pitch. So you could kind of hear the voice like super high pitch, like a chipmunk. And then it would go down. It would slide down all the way. And it it was so weird because it's like, you know how zealous that kind of radio is? It's so, it's, it's so um aggressive to listen to. Then with essentially demonic voice added on top of that so it's uh it was a very interesting experience and you know it almost feels paranormal in a sense and so this is a kind of a book that taps into that sort of feeling that we're kind of almost performing a little bit of magic when we're, we're listening to these signals and to me the fact that you can essentially build a working radio out of bits of wire and some crystals is pretty is pretty magic and so i think if you're interested in more the sort of i don't know the psychological aspects of this kind of audio this is a great book to to keep in mind and to and to and to read alvin luce is someone else who has really worked in a lot of you know he, he's sort of a pioneer of all the of many of the things that we're all interested in and his particular practice is really about interrogating um acoustic and technological properties of sounds and spaces. Um, I actually got to interview him as part of the Some Call It Noise work because he had a kind of a very short period, really, like one or two years where he was building very low frequency antennas and he was he was kind of in that world. Um, and when I came to sort of be prototyping some of the early stage visuals for this, for this NASA um, show, one of them is a, a real-time VLF feed coming in and rather than sort of hooking up an antenna to my computer at the time, I just kind of took some of Alvin Lucier's recordings and kind of put them through. Uh, and that was the, the, the start of that. But all of his work involves transduction in some way. He's used brain sensors. He's used bat sensors to listen to high frequencies. He has used VLF. He's used electromagnets to excite strings. He's really interesting to look at if you're interested in this, this kind of area. And uh, his his work is, again, extremely varied. He hasn't really, in his career, he didn't really spend a lot of time on one specific thing. He's really interrogating different um, spaces and ideas, which I think is super cool. And then, okay, the last person I wanted to talk about, he is an artist, but more than that he's an incredible resource of information i would say like anytime i want to find out how to make something better zach poff is the place to look he has done a lot of stuff in software but mainly he he makes he makes things so he has so many little projects his his website can be challenging to navigate but let's see Under electronics, he's got a lot of really interesting stuff. So he, he'll show you how to build ultrasound mics, bat simulators. He kind of reviews a bunch of recording gear. But his bat stuff I find really interesting for the hypersonic sound. And he does a lot of these with uh, 
pretty basic materials. He has a really good VLF antenna as well for folks that want to build something that's a little bit um, smaller than a loop. If you want to build a um, a whip antenna like Stephen McCreevy, you could you can look at some of Zach's um, recordings and 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 schematics. And he everything's open source, and it's all it's all fairly simple. He uses dead bug prototyping a lot, so it's just a couple of transistors, a couple of capacitors, and he gets good results from from that. So he's definitely worth checking out. I'd say a key resource for if you want to do anything with DIY audio. Um, he also has a really nice schematic for PA, a piezo preamp. So it's this little piezo preamp that will, if you don't want to buy something and try and make it yourself, then you can build something that will up your base and, and sort that impedance out. And also links out to things like this, which I guess isn't linked, but you can actually, if you want to take it even further, you can actually grow your own piezo crystals. Because essentially in a piezo disc, there's a, a crystal component that when it is excited by vibration, creates a little electrical impulse, and that's what's converted into sound. But you can actually, and I, I have tried this and it didn't work for me. I didn't quite get the solution right. But um you can grow your own piezo crystals, which I kind of want to try again. It does use some kind of like slightly, slightly caustic material. It's not like super good for you, um, but it would be really cool to actually like grow your own microphone crystals as a as a project. So that's something I want to I want to revisit. Okay, so that's kind of like that little that little intro bit. I think let's take a short five minute break um, and just kind of get our components in order. Um, we don't have to use Max MSP at all, but I have a few things from a previous workshop that might be interesting to look at. If you don't want to download Max, that's totally fine. It's not going to be impactful to what happens next in any way. Um, but there's a couple of things that you could use later. I'll show, I'll show you how they work and you could use later um, a, as kind of tools. But just make sure to have your wire, something to strip the wire with. I've just got scissors, nothing fancy. If you have a cigarette lighter, really good way of removing that enamel. And if you don't, just something kind of that will rub off that enamel. Ideally sandpaper, but if not, you can go like ice and just have like a serrated knife and just kind of scrub it or some kind of um, like a nail file or something will do. And then we're kind of going to do a few a few things. So we'll do um, a few circuits. We'll do the coil pickup. We'll try making a solar microphone light center and we'll do a contact mic. And um, then I'll show you some more resources in how to do things like make a, a laser microphone if you want to kind of go beyond that. Okay, so let's say back at 158. And I'm going to make another cup of tea. Okay, see you in a minute.
Okay, so um, when folks are ready, we can we can get started making some stuff. It should be fun. The first thing I want to do is going to be extremely simple, but it's it's a nice little illustration. And I'm going to go between sharing my screen and not sharing my screen. So you can see what I'm actually doing. So having little plugs, like adapter plugs, can be a really useful thing to have as well to take um, mini jack to quarter inch. And so if I actually just go ahead and plug in a pair of, of regular headphones into a, an audio interface, I've got Let's see, I'm probably going to knock everything over here. I've got a little Zoom plugged in just so that you folks can hear. Um, but then for some stuff later, I'm using this little hand handheld thing. So we'll be mixing between me playing that. Hopefully, you'll be hearing it through my headphones and, and a little interface. But if I plug in to, to my Zoom, I should be able to play you I should be able to use this as a as a mic. And let's go back to sharing. And who's done this before? This is this is a fun little a fun little game if you haven't done it before. I'm just gonna use Max to take my input and I guess we'll do it through Zoom audio device so you can hear. But yeah, I can then talk through the headphones as a pretty janky little the little mic. mic which is could you hear that you could just hear my voice but so simple right and i think it's really illustrative of what of how of how malleable these these um these circuits can be like essentially we, we, we take that the output and we can convert into input and basically it's just reversing that magnetic coil and in one direction it's vibrating and the other direction it's converting vibration so we can create something from just switching the polarity of, of where that's going, just putting it in as an input rather than as a output. And for me, I think that's super cool and super, you know, but for some things, if you ever, if you ever are working in a recording studio and want to make someone sound like they're talking through a loudspeaker, then that's a very quick and effective way of, of doing that. Anyway, Going going back to, to some to some circuits, the the first thing I want us to look at is a is making a coil pickup. So hopefully we will have some some magnet wire, and basically what we're doing is we're creating something called an induction coil. And so the induction coil creates a tiny charge when electromagnetic energy is going past it, when it's in proximity to that, it creates a tiny amount of electrical energy in response. And by simply placing an audio jack on the end of that, we're able to reveal that spectrum. So what I want us to do is take our wire, and ideally we have something round that we can wrap it around. It could even be our finger, but something like a, like a pen. Like a, a large pen is good, but I want us to start off by, you know, making a making a decent length of of wire. You can kind of, um, let's do something like, like five or six feet. So I've made quite a long line there, and I'm gonna cut it. And you can go you can go longer or shorter. The the more material you have in your in your loop, it, the more um, it will be a little bit louder. That will help. So I've got my my wire here, and it's probably kind of hard to see, but there there we have it. And I'm going to take it and wrap it around this this pen, and let's do it in such a way that we have enough at the beginning and end of that loop to have something to plug into our into our 
the next stage, which is going to be the crocodile clips. And try and wrap it reasonably, reasonably tightly around. And it's kind of nice. It's kind of relaxing to to wrap bits of wire. Um, and then at the end, kind of try and keep it as in shape as possible and and then remove it from your from your pen. And for me, I like to use a little bit of electrical tape to secure that loop into um, a, a fully formed position, even a paper clip will will do So take your time with it, but when you're done, you should have, you know, a reasonably neat loop that looks something like that. And just make sure it's secured and that you have both ends available. It's really hard to show it distinctly on a, a zoom camera, but it should be a little loop with two available ends. It should look something like that. Okay, looking that's looking good, Stefan. Good. Yeah. How are people doing? Getting getting some loops. Looks good. Nice. Lots of neat loops. When we when we have something and it's and it's secured, the the next stage is to remove this little bit of we just want to take the the tip off on both ends so we can connect that up to our crocodile clips, which will connect to our jack plug. For me, as I said, the easiest way is a cigarette lighter. So we take each end and run it through. And again, it's going to be really challenging to, to see, but can you see how the tip of that is no longer red? It's kind of, it's just kind of like metal colored. Really hard to see on Zoom, but but basically that that heat just burns off that enamel. Um, but likewise, we can do it with any kind of um, any kind of um, rough surface to scrape that off.
Okay, have we been successful in stripping our ends? How's that going? Good. Got some, we got some stripped ends. That's perfect. So the next thing we should do is once our ends are nice and stripped, is we should have two crocodile clips or two alligator clips, whatever you call them. Um, pick whatever colors you like, doesn't matter. I've got a red and a green. And we should also have our audio plug. So you see, audio plug. I have a, a mono audio plug. For folks, some folks may have got stereo. Do we have stereo ones or mono ones? You you can kind of tell if it has a single band or two bands. So you've got a mono one there. You've got a stereo one that's cool. We'll work with that. Stefan, what have you got? Mono, cool. So for for Lauren. When you look at the when you look at the internal, you're going to have three terminals instead of two, and that's fine. It looked like you actually just had some some wire coming out of your plug already. Okay, great. So un unscrew the the band the band there so we can we can get in there. So the crocodile uh, plugs that we have here, they're a lot like this, rather than the ones with. Attached wires, I think. Ah. Okay. Do we just have the but, the ones with no wire? Yeah. Oh but dear. is there a way maybe to connect them? I don't know. Well, we could. Yeah, we can. We can do that with the. We can. There, there's presumably a terminal on there to 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 secure some wire, right? So let's let's do that. So we'll have to cut a new a new piece of wire to whatever length you you like that's uh i should have checked the links i thought they had um no okay. no i think because we're here in india it's a little different maybe the terminology okay so it got me that's okay but um there is just the wires in here yeah so basically um the ones that I have have already been wired up. And so for you, so if you don't have um, ones that have been wired up, you just have to create that link. And so what that would mean is creating a, a piece of, of wire and then again, stripping both ends so that the signal will pass through and you can connect. Um, and, and then you'll have a you'll have the, the correct clip. But it's, it's a bit of an extra stage. Does anyone else have the same, the same issue or do you have clips? Um, I'd put that down. Do you have clips that are more or less like this? Okay. So we'll connect to, it doesn't matter which end we connect to, but let's start off with this end. And for the mono plug, I'm going to take that and I'm going to plug it into the bottom terminal. So there should be two terminals. There should be one on this side. And if you go ahead later and, and want to wire this up and solder it, this is where you, you put that piece of wire. And then you would solder that in to that little hole. And then the second terminal is up. There you go. It's kind of hard to see up top that. So we'll start off with the bottom terminal. And you can just connect to, to the main piece of, of metal as well. You can just connect like that. And that's going to be fine. And then grab the other clip. We'll take the other end of our of our loop. Connect that. And then we'll connect to the top terminal. And so it should then look like that. For Lauren, though, you have to do a little bit extra because okay. um let's see i have a i have a i have a, a visual for you perfect that, that i'll bring up on the screen because i we did this a year ago and uh let's just share that
So yeah, it's not the best visual there, but you should have two terminals on the on the bottom. So just connect to the left side of the of the plug. So okay. So like on the the long one here, connect to only one of the points, like the left side point. Yeah, I'm just gonna enlarge the screen so I can see you better. Do you mind holding up the? Okay. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I sent India, there was a power cut here. Oh no! Um, oh. just connect to the left, the left hand side, and you should be, you should be okay. Okay, I think I got it. Okay, so we've got a little. It's a bit long, but we we have we have our induction loop, and it theoretically should work. What's cool about this is, is pretty much this is the this is the circuitry. We we've mastered the circuitry that we'll be using for today. Just just a, a, a whatever device we're using plugged into an input, and let's see if it works. I'll hold it up to my headphones so you can. Come over. Okay, I will play it through my interface so you can hear it. Um, let's see. Can you hear this? Mm. No, nothing? Okay. Then I will actually plug into my into my interface and okay bear with me so Did you hear that? Okay, for whatever reason, Zoom will only let me share my interface if I'm sharing my screen. I'm sure there's a, a, a stupid reason uh, that I can't figure out, but uh, I'll just share my screen for the, the time being. Um, if you happen to be using, I, I'm using it outside of, um, of this, generally just like an amplifier that's turned up loud will, will do the trick, but I guess it wasn't loud enough to, um, come through the headphones. So if you do ever end up using an interface like a Zoom, what I what I would recommend is setting it to um, mono input so you can just have one channel plugged in and you hear it back with rather than in the left or the right ear. Uh, you hear it back just in both. So, so mono is good. And then um, what's good about the Zoom is you have a very large amount of gain. So you can really you can really ramp it up. But Let's just go back there. Um, I'll play some more sounds. And, and for me, a really good source of, of these types of, of EM sounds is the, um, the the computer disk itself has like obviously like a very large array of, of, of sounds, also things that are very immediate, like say a phone. So this is my computer hard drive right now. And as I move across it, and let's grab my phone. If I touch it, we'll try and take a photo. So yeah, let's see if I can work out a way of showing you. It's kind of hard to hold things up at once, but I, so my phone and then 
putting it on the screen. And so moving it over different areas of that circuit create different outputs, right? Because it's it's a small loop. So the bigger what the bigger loops do is they're I'll just turn this off. Uh, what the bigger loops do is they 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 have a a wider area that they're picking up in, right? They can pick up more stuff. Uh, we can really think of the small loops as something that's more um, directional. Um, Nicholas Collins calls them circuit snippers. So we can place them onto various parts of our circuits or electric um, devices and hear that close up. But often we actually have to put the loop directly onto the device. Um, you can kind of hear that if I move towards the phone. It's caught behind that. So we can hear that right on the phone, but as I move away. Um, we can we can we can hear that it's got a, a directional quality as well. Um, what I'll also do is let me get the now we have the audio bit sorted out. This is going to be a bit more flexible. I can put it on the uh, on the mic input and hopefully. So we're hearing like a lot of like a lot of periodic electrical noise as as well. Has anyone been able to hook up to an amplifier and get some sound? So I managed to wire the alligator clips, two okay. alligator clips. Amazing. Just keep the part where they have to be. How does it have to be wired with the PRS? Yeah, so I'm just gonna add this. Are you are you on a mono or a stereo? It looks like you're mono. mono I, I mean, Perfect. Yeah. One, so one if you're able to see the the picture on the on the screen, if I am, I should be sharing right. Um. So basically, you just connect each arm of the loop. Uh, it doesn't matter which side of the you you can you can kind of connect to whichever inlet you choose, but connect one arm to the bottom inlet and one arm to the top inlet, and then you can plug into your, your Perfect. device. Perfect. Stereo left side is good.
Has anyone heard any sounds yet? No sounds? Are you hooked up, Lauren? Yeah, I don't know if I, okay. I don't know if I'm doing this properly. Um, so I connected at the top here because that's the only spot where I have this sort of like line in, but I, I don't know, it's not doing anything. And you have it on to record and and um like set to line in. Try yeah, I think so. I'm gonna try really shoot with. Try really pushing the um the 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 gain as well on the uh, on the preamp. Okay. Okay. You have some sound? It's working, but I'm still, I mean, with my fingers, if I do things, then there's sound, but yeah, with a lot of gain on the Zoom. Okay. Yeah, on on the Zoom, I'm putting it to 100% gain. And on the on the amp that I have, I'm putting it into uh, overdrive. So I'm putting it to the, you know. But actually, uh, like, if you take it closer to the Zoom, it catches its interface interference also. Yeah, if you put it right on, on the zoom or, or up close to it, it will it will create for at least for my zoom, it's like a higher pitch, like ee. yeah. Cool things to try listening to are routers. So so like a Wi-Fi router sounds really good because you, you you get those packets of information sending. Obviously, computers and phones sound good. Um, a microwave sounds insane. It's just extremely. Extremely, extremely loud and boomy. It's very similar to the Soma Ether also. Yeah. Okay. How are other folks doing? Did, did the game work, Lauren? Uh, not yet, although I think I'm trying to troubleshoot with my zoom right now because i think i may not like i put it in i realize this actually says line out is that uh, okay yeah line out will <laughs> not give you sound unfortunately so i don't how do i plug this in then so if you have um yeah so you you have the headphone jack um do, what are your inputs on the bottom like, do you have like trs xlr inputs Okay. Mm, yeah. So I think you may, and I'll look up, I'll look up in a bit what that zoom can take, but you may need something like like this. Um. Oh. But you can also oh, actually. Uh, it, it is, you have a mini jack, is it? Which you have a. Yeah, mark? I have a yeah, and an eight. Um, because uh, uh, near where the microphones are, is there a little uh, at the top? Is there a little mini input? No, on the other side. On this side? Yeah, like somewhere around where the mics are. Yeah. Okay. One of the, let's see if that fits the mini jack. Yeah, it does. Okay, I'll try yeah. that. So that's where they hide it. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. I don't know if you have to adjust something on your settings to for it to look to that input. But but, but oh, also um a tip yeah. for a tip for that. Well, I I like to have a bunch of these these converters around. Um this is this isn't really like a fancy component or anything, but um, it's just a mini two quarter inch. I I bring them a lot because I I do sort of live visuals, and most places don't necessarily have a a, a quarter inch jack. So sometimes they give you like a mini jack, and I have to fit it into my device. And I'm like, okay, I'm just always bringing a, a converter just in case. And you can pick them up the the home hardware on um, but on a like the Bathurst on college, Bathurst on college, because you're in Toronto, right? That has in the basement, it has a really great electronics section. And so you can buy these types of converters or or like the actual component itself for like a dollar or 50 cents. It's it's wow. a good, if you're in Toronto, that's a, that's a good resource to pick up uh, little bits and pieces. But yeah, these these converters are great because you can just take like I did with the headphones, right? I could just take that mini and plug it into a quarter inch, and and it gives you a lot of a lot of potential. That's awesome. Thank you. I'll check. I'll check that out.
what I thought was an amplifier turned out to not be an amplifier. <laughs> um, and then I have, I had a question. I'll have to do this again when I, um, when I rent a zoom, but um, does the amplifier have to be like quite powerful to do this? I like, do. I have yeah. These, yeah. Yeah. I have like a, a very mini LM386 thing. You should, you should um, try it. Like yeah. for, for for this, like if I, I have, this is like the, my little handheld one that I, that I bring around. Um, it's, I love it. It's like 10 bucks and it has two modes. It has on, which is just like, you know, regular audio playback. And okay. if I go over, which one? I wonder if it's going, yeah, you probably can't hear anything at all. I can hear something, but it's really quiet. And then. Okay. Again, like I don't know if I'm going from I'll just put this up to the screen so you can potentially hear the mic. Does that come through? I don't think so. Really? It's like so loud on my end. I guess like Zoom's filtering it or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. So obviously you can't hear it, but, but but basically like drive really helps. Like putting it in overdrive. So okay. you will still get a signal with it with a less powerful amplifier. Um, but to make it sound cool, it's it's always good to then just like boost it in post. Yeah. Okay, cool. I got it. Thank you, everyone. Yay. <laughs> That's good. Darren saved the day. Always. <laughs> That's great. Something else to think about for folks is the, the core component we've just built is really an induction coil. And if you go to a if you go to a hardware store and buy an old telephone or all sorts of things, they all have these induction coils in them. So you can find all sorts of different induction coils with magnets in them. And they're going to give you different different levels of power. Like some are going to be really good pickups. Some are going to pick up different parts of that spectrum. So you can, you can build different coils of different sizes and lengths yourself, but you can also go and take apart old gear and, and find all sorts of weird little, little pickups. Like, you know, and even take out large chunks of, of wire from these things and, and um, convert that into, into um, audio. Did any of you ever, when you were kids, when you had the old school telephones, have the, um, it was called like the telephone sniffer. And it was so like, you could put it onto the, the, the speaker part of the telephone. And it essentially was like an induction coil. And it would, it would translate the, um, it would translate the signal that's coming through the, the speaker into, into, a, into audio that you could record. So obviously it's not really something we have to do anymore because we have access to all that stuff, but essentially that was a, was a, is a, is a, was an induction coil as well. So it's kind of fun just to play around and see, and see what different inductors can do. You can also buy them, buy them off the internet. If you're near an electronics shop, the electronics shop will definitely have induction coils. And so you can buy ones of varying um, capacity, which is really cool. Okay, Darren and Stefan, how are you doing with getting some sound? Um, I have my challenges, but <laughs> in the process of my, uh, I have a lot of trouble doing tactile things right okay. now because I can't. I have one eye, so and, mm. uh, and I shake, so I have a good combination of uh, factors. But what I discovered though is that here at uh, NASA there was already. Uh, a coil wrapped around something. Oh, nice. So I was a pre made a coil, but then I realized, oh, I've got one right in front of me. Why don't I just use that? So mm -hmm. I was, my question though was like, how much, like, this is just, you know, whatever, some random amount. But is there any, I know that with antennas, there's a, you know, uh, a ratio between the size of the antenna and the, the broadcast frequency that you transmit on. Um, does it matter with these? 
is it just a question of its degree of sensitivity or is that what it like you know these uh, ones so these ones are pretty the building with wire yeah. then we'd have a lot of sensitivity yeah these ones are pretty rough and ready and and really you can just build any old coil and plug it in if it's bigger it will be more sensitive okay there's something like a vlf antenna then then that stuff for me at least becomes more you have to you have to be more specific about it and i believe for building a vlf antenna it has to have um a radius of 12 meters square and so okay. that obviously is dependent on like what size your loop is but generally a lot of folks will build around a bicycle wheel and do something like 30 or 40 loops uh and and okay. that will tune it to pick up in that in that band which is um okay. i think 30, 30 to 30 hertz to 30 kilohertz it's quite wide and so what's what we're great, doing is yeah so this is a coil pickup rather than a than a vlf pickup yeah yeah a vlf making. pickup would take us a lot longer to build and we would have to use a lot of wire and it's it, it'd be it'd be big um but it's the exactly the same principle right like it's like it's it's an induction coil it's just a, a much bigger induction coil that allows us to pick okay. up those long those long wavelengths okay Yay, it worked. I see a thumbs up. Yes. Is it loud it's enough? Like cold right now. Oh, nice. Um, it's kind of. But it's audible. Uh, it's audible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's great. So I think everyone, Stefan, were you able to get anything? No, no, no joy? Are you, are you on the Zoom as well? Uh, yes, I've got a Zoom. I've got uh, uh, this guy. Okay. And uh, I've tried plugging into the the, uh, the back of it for the mic jack back here, and uh, not getting any joy as yet. Okay. And you're using a mono plug as well, right? Or is it a stereo? Uh, I've got a mono, but I'm going to try a stereo just to see if that makes any difference. Okay. Okay. I have mono and stereo. Well, I'll loop Options. back to um to check on that in a minute. In the interest of time, because I want to move on to one or two more things, I'm going to sort of go through a, a few more slides and introduce the next thing I wanted to show you. Um, so in terms of the, the, the patches, if you are a Max user or want to use want to try this stuff out with Max. I built a few things for a, a previous workshop uh, that do different things, um, basically inspired by, um, I don't know if any of you know the, the artist Holly Herndon. Holly Herndon in her early performances used to use like electromagnetic pickups, um, but not to generate sound. She wasn't playing back the electromagnetic sound. She had it plugged into an audio interface, like, you know, like, like a Zoom or something. Uh, and then was using it as a control voltage. So for example, if she wanted to sweep a filter, she could move it over loud sections of her computer disk. And so she could actually have like a physical, um, a physical performative element there. So there are a few patches. The one I wanted to show you, and because uh, I look silly in it, is this envelope in position where essentially you're taking an envelope and it doesn't have to be electromagnetic. It can be anything, but it works really well with an electromagnetic audio Im impulse. And you can use that signal to control stuff. It's gonna, I'm gonna mute you as well, Stefan, sorry, but uh, I'll, we'll, we'll chat later. Um, okay. And I think I'm still sharing sound. And so I'll show you just the, the, so, the bit that it does. Um, that is fun. Mainly because I look really silly. A filter control, which controls a low pass filter. And so the sound is in this case continuously playing, um, I guess as it was before, but previously the, the volume was being modulated. And this, uh, the, a, lo a low pass filter is going to be um, Okay. what we're changing. So the well. sound is consistent, but the filter will change.
So it's just playing back. There's just some white noise playing back, and then I'm just applying a filter. Obviously, you can apply it to to anything. Um, a little later, I I play it a Ben Clock track. Uh, finally, I'm going to show you audio file. Let's go back to volume control. So in this case, I have an audio file and I'm controlling it. I, I just, there's a section later where I get really too into controlling the audio file. Um, but this is this is something you can take apart. You can you can work with it in your own stuff. But the interesting thing is that you can take this incoming signal and rather than treating it as, you know, a piece of sound, you can treat it as a control voltage or, or a control signal. And you can take that and you can you can have it do other things. And so I find this to be a really useful um, technique in a lot of a lot of projects is just taking very simple audio based inputs that act as a sensor. And, and have them control something without the need of working with microcontrollers even. Like you just have something plugged in. It's, it's, it's such a simple um, way of collecting that energy and having it do something. So I wanted to, I wanted to share that. There's also, this one can be fun. Um, it's a bit random, but basically it applies the FFT of a sound. So you can basically the, the, the structure and frequency of a sound to another sound. So you could have something um, playing and then affect it by an incoming signal again that could be electromagnetic or it could be um, something else but but it, it's an interesting technique to play with and finally just a random granular thing which just sounds good on electromagnetic recordings next slide um we're not going to find cool em sounds we can do that later but it's it's uh it's fun to play around with and do um the next thing I wanted to introduce, because I think it's really cool, is a, a solar listener. And, and so we have, um, and I'll be upfront, I've, I've had varying degrees of success with this personally. Uh, it's something I want to play around with, with more, but um, we should have some kind of like solar panel, hopefully. And, and we can... Um, yeah, that's great. And basically, we already have our little plug set up for the for the coil. So we can build we can build a new setup, or we can just take off that coil, and we can plug into the the two inlets. So on mine, I have an inlet here, and an and a, well a terminal and a terminal here, on the solar panel. So again, a super, a super simple hookup. Depending on what you have, you might have some outlets. Um, you might have some wires coming out. And then plug that into the, the jack plug. While um, you look at that, I'm going to play this video that inspired me to sort of play around this. Uh, has anyone come across Leaf Cutter John? Okay, Leaf Cutter John's another person, along with Nicholas Collins, who I, I'd suggest adding to your um, list of people doing interesting things with 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 sound and technology. He um, later made this big light powered sort of synthesizer, essentially, and he would control everything through through light. And he made this very performative interface. But he's a he's a fantastic electronic musician from the UK uh, who also does really good um, tutorials. So this is this is kind of where I learned to to do this. And I haven't achieved as good results as, as Leaf Cutter John, but um, it does work. So we'll need a jack lead, um, a little amplifier, a couple of uh, crocodile clips, a little cheap uh, laser pointer, it's like £1.50, um, this is a solar cell, which is uh, very low power, and uh, it's about one pound fifty as well. And a couple of uh, clothes pegs, uh, and a nice cup of tea, which is yeah. So, so that's the setup essentially. And again, it's it's basically like our induction coil. We're just taking the 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 output of that solar panel and putting it into our into our input. 
for me, one of the reasons it doesn't work super well is my solar panel's a little bit more powerful than, than what's used in the tutorial. The best is about five volts. Um, so with my one, let's see if I can plug it in. With my one, um, you get, if there's any light, you get a very strong signal. Let's fire up my max patch. It's going to mute you down. So. It's coming in. So if I point it at the window, turn off because the echo. If I point it at say the window, uh, it creates a, a stronger impulse. And I should have also I forgot to, but I should have also added laser pointer to the to the list because the laser pointer is is something that will help to to do specific um, activation of the the solar panel. If you're just kind of placing things uh, near the solar panel, it's it's kind of activated um, really just by light. But my phone, for example, will give a very specific, um, do that again. come through so that's just responding to the the screen of my phone um as i move it away the, the light frequencies and the pulsing of of the light coming out of the phone but it it will obviously give you quite a generalized beam of light so this is a lot easier to try in a darkened a darkened room it's very it's actually very useful um as a tool to again similarly to creating um the, the previous patch I showed you where we're taking that electromagnetic input and using that as a value. If you wanted to play solar panels and, and just have them not playing back audio, but recording the the day the daily light or whatever, it's a very easy and cheap way of making a, a light tracker throughout the day. And you could just have that voltage coming in and, and make some controls. Uh, and very similar um, to, you can use, um, Depending on the photodiode you have, you can use photodiodes as well. And um, when you shine a bright light on them, it creates it can create various things. My photodiodes, I've used large photodiodes in the past and they work really well. The ones I brought for this only work if I shine an incredibly bright light onto the onto the the um the thing, like a laser. So less good. Um, they can be useful if you build a bit more circuitry for them, but the, I find the solar panels really effective for, for that kind of collection. Leaf Color John's tutorial is really good. I wanted to play that clip again where I'm using essentially the laser to listen through some viscous liquid, some fizzy liquid. and also um, play back a record. Unfortunately, both my record players are at New Adventures in Sound Art right now, so I couldn't um, I couldn't recreate the spinning, but I, I found a record on the shelf, uh, the Snailsville Gastropod Jamboree, which uh, is, a, is less good than you'd imagine. Um, and I did a little scratching where obviously it, you don't get the rotation, but you can, you can run over the, you can run over the, the disc with a laser or something that's reflecting the light. A laser works well because you catch the grooves individually. It's it's fine enough. If you're working with a bigger light, it's going to come across and be slightly more noisy. Uh, but essentially you can you can scratch a record with a with a laser. So that's uh, how you would scratch a record with a with a laser. 
how is the uh how's the hookup of the solar panels going good did it work for you stefan good you got one that's good and just be careful lauren if you're listening on headphones just it could it can be quite loud so just just don't um deafen yourself So would you respond to even like the torch from a phone or does it need like really, really bright light? Oh, it should respond to a torch from the phone. I At least in my one, I find it to be very sensitive. Um, I find that the baseline of noise, if there's light in the room, is already quite high. It's already creating a, a hum. Um, and mm -hmm. then it just gets added to. But if you if you turn off all the lights or try it at night in a dark room, then the baseline of noise is a lot quieter. So it depends how sensitive it is to light because in the leaf cutter John example, he's using a slightly lower powered um, panel. It, um, it doesn't get so much feedback or it doesn't get so much of the, the input of the light. It, it's more directional, um, which is why he can kind of play, play with it a little bit. But, um, but yeah, turning, turning down the interference of light will help. Cool, we hear the hum. Turn off the light. Dan, I had a question about, um, like, I'm using a photo sensor or, um, like, one of these little guys. I thought they worked by increasing resistance um, as the light changes. But then with the solar panel, which I don't have right now, um, that's that works differently, right? Like that. Yeah. Yeah, Is I guess the, the solar panels converting the the light into a, a, like a, a form of electrical signal, right? Like, yeah. And and with the photoresistors, it, it's more like you can add it to a circuit to make things louder and, and quieter. They they do work if a lot of signals put in, but if you go to something like the like the Nicholas Collins book, a lot of his um his circuits involve little little photo resistor things and it's they're, they're really nice to have on hand to um to add into Let's see where we go with that yeah he has a whole a whole chapter on using photo resistors yeah cool and it's 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 good but yeah they they do work but you have to have a really a lot of signal so I found mm -hmm. um, at least this small one is not as exciting as ones I've previously used, and and I have to shine a, a laser directly on it to get a change. So it's it's not as um, exciting as I was hoping. So the final thing I want to show, and I know we're still on the solar panel, but in the I know we have a, a limited amount of time, and we can we can you know this is being recorded, so we can like loop back. And, and watch it at a later date. But again, we have our we have our circuit. We have our our input, which is it. And we have our output. So our output's connected to that jack plug. And a little piezoelectric disc, which is going to take, uh, remember how I talked about that little crystal that when it vibrates, it makes a little electrical signal. We can just hook that up. Some of them hopefully the ones that you have have terminals on them they can be really fiddly to hook up to if it's just the the disc itself and they're quite they're quite delicate um so don't pull too hard but hopefully you have the the terminals and a little bit of wire attached and then I'll find bit to plug in I'll just plug this into the zoom So 
So then, so I'm just going to type, and you can actually hear my voice uh, resonating through the through the computer as well a little bit. So you can put it on different servers and see what happens. I'll turn it off while I move it because it's extremely it's extremely loud. Um, but let's say I put it on the the desk surface. And I'm going to turn down my gain quite a lot because it's set up for gain on the uh, on the the EM pickup. Obviously, uh, a desk is maybe not the most interesting place, but you can put this on different vibrational services and essentially uh, pick pick those up. Let's see if um, the computer whirring is interesting. Not really. So you can put it on different parts of the, the computer as well and, and, and um, Sniff, sniff out some sounds. But these are really useful um, for if you want to build specific instruments and build pickups for those instruments. A piezo disc is like extremely, extremely useful. It's useful for, um, again, putting on metal objects. So so things like bridges that that resonate, you can, you can essentially mic them up using piezo discs and get those, those resonances of those bridges. Um, what you can also do is take a component like this and make it ready for water. So like in that video I played you earlier today. That is a that's the same device, but just in this in this packaging that allows me to put that in into um into the water. You can do this as well, but just by coating it in 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 sort of um, dip plastic. You can just dip it in some dip plastic or hot glue, and then it will form a a covering that will protect it from from water. And there's a few a few folks um, making these things. Like if you if you actually want to buy one, you can buy one from this chap. who makes yeah who makes his own contact microphones um and hydrophones i wouldn't necessarily buy a contact from him but if you want to buy a hydrophone um he'll he'll ship them out and they look a bit like this so it's all ready to go um, and they're relatively effective. I've used them. I've used them in recordings and stuff. Uh, but essentially, um, I believe I don't believe there's any extra circuitry in there. It's it's just the contact in a bottle cap type thing that resonates a little bit more, uh, and then attached to a, to a cable with with some with some waterproofing. So you can look at you can look at that. Other forms of I mean, there's tons of transducers. So obviously. Um, I'd recommend looking at Zach's stuff. He he has all sorts of cool, um, cool circuitry, cool ideas for different for different microphones. Um, but what I've been really interested in lately is this thing called a geophone, which is essentially a a seismometer that picks up vibration. So it it, it can be used in picking up seismic vibration. So you could actually build this pretty much using the techniques that we've used today. It's just sourcing the components are a lot more expensive than what we've been working with. Like I think the component in itself is about $80. $80. Uh, but essentially what it is, is it's a, a capsule and it's quite sensitive. So when it when it's um when it vibrates based on like a large amount of seismic activity, then it creates a signal. And so it performs really well under like one kilohertz. So pretty low frequency, which I guess you'd expect for, for, for seismic stuff. So I've not actually been able to get one of these long geophones. They're, they're really hot 
tickets, I guess. So they always sell out really quickly. But I, I did buy something that's similar called Interharmonics. It's also a geophone. And I actually haven't really used it very much, but from my experiments early on, it's been quite effective. And uh, I'm looking forward to playing with it more. It has a few um, quirks. So it has this, um, you can basically input a cable to it. It has it has the inputs that you need uh, to, to set it up to essentially work with say XLR. It also comes with a, a smaller cable that will plug into XLR. Automatically, it has a magnet on the tip. So that magnet will allow you to pin it to a metal surface. It also has a pike, so you can stick it in the ground and, and uh, have a good connection there. And a, a suction cup in case there's no ground and no magnetic material to attach to. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty cool um, little device. But if you wanted it to, to Let's see if I can spell size on it. If you wanted to try making one yourself using some of the techniques we have uh, used today, you can buy geophone components. And essentially, it's just a big coil. And so you can buy them. Generally, they're from like specialist spaces. Um, and they come to like 80, 80 to 100, so something like this. Um, and sometimes they don't have a have a price and you have to inquire, but generally um, the geophone elements like 80 to $100. So it's actually, it's not that much more expensive if you're able to buy a pre-made one that someone's already sold it up. I, I would probably recommend doing that because then you don't have to have the, um, the, oh. the the process of doing that and the, the terminals can be a bit hard to solder to. So if you if you're not so comfortable with soldering, you could um have a have a tough time. And the other thing I wanted to show you as something that I think is fun going forward. Oh, uh, Dan, before you do that, I just mentioned that the uh, the loam who make the, the geophone is hard to find. When I was a uh, teenager, they recently, oh, they recently made a uh, a kit version that's more readily available uh, um, uh, that you can connect together, but it has, I guess it follows their instructions. I think I saw that. Yeah, so for a little bit less, you can buy the kit, but you still have to do a bit of soldering, I think. They also sell um, pizza. So you can you can really buy anything from from them. This this video actually is really fun. And so basically what this person does is he builds a fairly powerful um, laser microphone and kind of shows you how to do it. In in this instance, he's playing, I think, Die Hard in his living room and he's he's shining the laser onto the, the, the pane of glass. And so the vibrations of the audio are like vibrating the glass, which is which is creating a little change in the laser. Uh, which is then just broadcasting back onto a solar panel, similar to what we've been working with. And um, you can actually hear the audio. Okay, great, but my living room is probably glowing green. So if you want to get deeper into this stuff, then there's a lot of great tutorials like this that will show you how to make like a, a laser microphone. And... That was something that people in the military would, would were working with for quite a while, um, particularly in in like infrared light spectrum, so people couldn't see it. Um, trying to hack into hear hear conversations from far away, which is kind of an interesting um, subsection of all this sound stuff. Is a lot of it kind of comes from trying to tap into people for espionage. Like I was saying earlier, the the induction coils used to be in those little telephone sniffers where you could kind of listen to what people were saying so uh yeah some of this technology has a crossover with uh surveillance so from my end that's that's the things i wanted to sort of, sort of share with you today i hope you all got stuff working and had had some fun i can stick around for a little bit if, if there's like questions or you just want to have a chat but i'll stop the recording now